this week, um, <clears throat> there's been sort of tense relations between Turkey and Israel. They were just sort of starting to repair their relationship um, and get to a better trade agreement and all this other kind of stuff. But it's become very apparent that President, I always say, and Rogan, how do you all say it? I don't know what the right terminology is. Aragon, okay. Aragon. <laughs> um, Aragon and him um, have been trying to play nice in public, but in the background, Hamas is actually being funded right out of Turkey in Syria against Israel. So um, I'll just read the first part of it. President uh, Aragon uh, insists that Hamas activity on Tuesday is strictly political, but Israel's security establishment is warning otherwise. Um, and that's the, the byline after that. Israel's security establishment is warning the country's political echelon not to get overexcited about the possibility of improving relations with Turkey, while the possibility of a meeting uh, in Istanbul between Turkish uh, President Recep uh, Tayyip Erdogan and Israel's President Isaac Herzog, uh, which Erdogan mentioned only a few days ago, is a sparking hope in Israel's foreign ministry. Security experts are trying to calm everyone down. The defense secur and security apparatus is keeping tabs on the latest romance with Turkey which used to be Israel's uh, strategic military and intelligence partner, but which is in the past decade opened up arms to Hamas and other branches of the Muslim Brotherhood in the Middle East. Officials are worried that a number of uh, understandings and agreements between Israel and the allies, such as Egypt, Greece, Cyprus, would be affected if Jerusalem moves towards Anakarna. Um, yeah. Uh, was this shift in Turkey just start with this leader Erdogan, or it was the start before him? Before him. Okay. So <clears throat> we're going to look at a timeline of the relationship between Israel and Turkey. But what country are they represented in the Bible? Anybody know? Yep, the Garma. That's it. So um, Jeopardy, five hundred points. <laughs> Gift to you. Um, so the big thing to realize here is everybody's empire building. So the leader of China is building his empire. Russia thinks he's the new czar. What does the president of Turkey, and what is his ambition to get back to in history? Yes, Randy. The Ottoman Empire. They want to rule North Africa, the entire Middle East, and more of Europe if they can get their hands on it. So. They miss it. It was gone in 1917. It's been over 100 years since they had it. Um, it made way for the land to be freed up in World War II, freed up the Jews to return in their aliyahs back to this. So two of the verses that I think is really it interesting, it says, Eden will become a possession, fear will become a possession of his enemies, but Israel will triumph. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 3, it says, he is to say to them, listen, Israel, today you are about to engage in battle with your enemies. Do not be cowardly. Do not be afraid, alarmed, or terrified because of them. So this trade agreement is the first step. You can kind of see here that the, this is the Turkey-Israel bilateral trade from 2005 to 2017. That's the best I could find. I tried and tried to get one for 2021. I couldn't find one. Um, but you can see... There's a whole lot being more imported by Turkey from Israel than there is being exported. And that's, I think, in millions of dollars. Okay, would someone like to read on the right? Go ahead, Jesse. Information making its way to the defense and security establishment these past few months is worrying. While Erdogan is laying the groundwork in preparing Turkish public opinion, for a change in relations with Israel and senior Israeli officials are in contact with the head of Turkey's national intelligence organization, Khan Fadan. Hamas command continues to operate in Turkey and execute terrorist acts and attempted attacks on Israel, Judea, and Samaria. Israel is looking into a recent report that Turkey has deported several Hamas operatives, but in general, Hamas in Turkey continues to operate its Istanbul headquarters recruiting Arab Israelis and Palestinian Arabs 
for intelligence work and they carry out terrorist acts. So it's not a very good trade idea to harbor terrorists against another country while trying to strike uh, a trade economic agreement between them. So that's a big problem. Um, the last part down here says senior Hamas member uh, Salia al Aruri um, from Turkey uh, supposedly deported Israeli request continues to, to um, handle its people there and even organize training and target practice in Turkey. The possibility that Turkey and Israel could resume uh, cooperation on intelligence is also causing some misgivings. Israel used to be worried that Turkey handled Israeli information over to Iran. So uh, the isolationism of Israel in the Middle East is still happening and I think that's one of the prophecies that we're kind of looking for and for Turkey to basically they want to broker an agreement this is what they put themselves forth I, did, I didn't put this article in here because it was just too much but Turkey wants to broker the peace agreement between Ukraine and Russia and I'm like really <laughs> I'm just very surprised they want to stick themselves into the middle of it because they shot down one of their planes if you remember the foreign media reports claim that Turkey was exposed to the uh, identities of local Iranian agents who met with their Mossad handlers and former Israeli uh, Prime Minister Ehud Barak used to say that Sadan was pro-Iran. The fact that a few leaders of the Turkish defense establishment today are identified as Muslim Brotherhood members along with Turkey's ties with Iran does nothing to boost the low level of trust between Israel and Turkey. So it's becoming well apparent to the rest of the Middle East as well. Um, can someone read the one on the right here? Um, Casey? Only a month and a half ago, the Israel Security Agency Shin Bet arrested four members of a Hamas cell in the village of Zarif near Hebron. The cell had been directed from Turkey by Ad Rahman Ramanat, an associate of Aruri, who was released in the prisoner exchange deal for captive soldier Gilad Shalit. The Hamas network in Judea and Samaria that the Shin Bet exposed a month before those arrests, which was plotting major terrorist act attacks, including shootings, abductions, and suicide bombings, was also being handled from Turkey by Aruri and Sakriya Najib an Eastern Jerusalem native who was one of the men who kidnapped IDF soldier Nashan Waxman and who was also released in the Shalit deal. According to indictments filed against three Eastern Jerusalem residents, Najim had formerly tried to enlist Adam Musulmani, a resident of the Shafat refugee camp, to kill one of three possible targets former Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat, former Israel Police Commissioner Roni Akshesh, or former Knesset member Yehuda Glick. He even reportedly offered Muslimani money and training in Turkey. I'm sorry, Joe, the font is too big. It's really hard to read. <laughs> too big? Okay. Well, thank you, because you read all the, the foreign names extremely well, so that I, I made it size 18, which I thought would be big enough. Because it's what, but when you're sitting a little further back, it's kind of hard. So um, this is basically telling us a couple lessons that Israel's learning here. What would be one of them? Go ahead, Randy. That their enemies are operating from Turkey. Right. Two. The big one is every time they release anybody, they turn into a terrorist and go to another country and do even worse things. So Israel letting go of their prisoners in any way has never been a good idea. Um, better to take no prisoners, I would say, in their, in their political world. So this is an article following up on the first bullet. It says, the ISA investigations led operations during this considerable um, ordinance was seized in the sorry, from the infrastructure, including sufficient explosive materials to make three or four explosive belts by uh, United um, Israel staff. The Israeli security agency, in cooperation with the IDF and the Israeli police, have uncovered an extreme Hamas infrastructure that was directed 
by senior Hamas officials abroad and operating throughout Judea and Samaria in order to perpetuate various attacks, including large scale um, in Judah and Samaria, as well as Jerusalem were seized. So it's amazing to me, first of all, that they're starting to use Samaria as a real term now because that's what Israel had always wanted. Um, but the fact that this was thwarted, this was in November of last year, and this article is referring back to it, so I just thought I'd give you some context on that. Um, so this is very hard to read. I'll send you guys the, the email, but it's as large as I could make this one. But this is the long arm of Iran. It's an infographic made by the Embassy of Israel to show all those countries in red are influenced by Iran and what they're doing. Um, and you can see the worldwide effect. So um, on September 10th, 2019, the US Commerce Department announced it would be a, uh, applying sanctions to 15 terrorist operations and money changers that help terrorist organizations. It published a list that included operatives and companies in Turkey that help transfer money to Hamas. The Americans also reported that the main source of the money sent to Hamas from Turkey and, other, and sometimes through Lebanon is Iran and that Iran's food forces is responsible for directing the funds. So again, this is like a swath all the way through the Middle East, literally through the Levant state of money going from one place to the other. Um, yeah. So the red areas on the map were places where terrorist activity had occurred. Um, some of them, yes, and some of them were connections. Um, like Iran's sphere of influence expands into Yemen. Out of Iran into Africa, Hezbollah scrambles for Africa. So it's where they're taking territories and also where there's terrorist uh, things. So this one up here says, car bombs target Israeli envoys in India and Georgia. Iran boosts military support in Syria to bolster Assad. Azerbaijan arrests plot suspects um, cities linked to Iraq. So yeah, all global of them terror yeah. activity. I'm sorry, it's it's a map of Iran's global terror activity in the last four years, according to the bottom. Yep, and and where they're kind of expanding to too. Yep. So um, do you have a reader for this one? Go ahead, Randy. The killer visited Turkey. The American report mentioned the name Sir Jabaram, a high-ranking Hamas official in Turkey, as having sent hundreds of thousands of dollars to Judea and Samaria to find Hamas terrorist activity. Israel suspects that Jabaram, who has been appointed deputy leader of Hamas in the West Bank, is still involved in similar activities from Turkey and that he was involved in a recently exposed system of money transfers in the West Bank. Jabaran is responsible for building up Hamas military capabilities from the organization's headquarters in Istanbul. The headquarters also oversees the development of Hamas maritime and rocket capabilities, as well as its cyber warfare, development of the new weapons, and the transfer of Iranian money. It also has a branch in Lebanon, and Israel has demanded that Turkey put a stop to all these activities. An interesting question that has yet to be answered, at least publicly, is whether the killer of Elahu David Kay in the old city of Jerusalem some t two months ago was trained and handled from Turkey. Fadi Habu Sabakim, a prominent opponent of Jews being allowed to visit the Temple Mount, and who had connections to senior members of the Jordanian WAF of the Temple Mount, made several visits to Turkey in the recent years, meeting with Hamas operatives there. I think he was finally killed. That's that guy at the end, Fadi Abu. I don't even try the last name. So basically, it's all these different terrorist activities. It's cyber warfare, it's weapons, it's guns, and they're putting money into, um, from Turkey into Syria and Lebanon against them. And Israel's having a hard time keeping up, I'm sure, because they're already fighting the, the weapons that are coming in from Iran into Syria on their northern border. And then they're also trying to defend themselves against a country they're supposed to do trade with in Turkey. So it's really out of control. Um, and obviously, Israel's very worried. But we hadn't covered a lot on Turkey. This is a timeline of Turkish-Israel relations. And it hasn't always been horrible, but um, you know, 1948 is when they were established, but basically the Ottoman Empire was broken up in World War I, um, and most of the Middle East regarded Israel as an enemy. 
and 49 Turkey uh, formally recognized Israel in 1950. Turkey opens its diplomatic uh, mission in Tel Aviv. Uh, Israel, in 1956, um, Israel occupies the Suez Canal. Turkey downgrades its diplomatic relationship um, and charges with uh, affairs. In 1963, Turkey upgrades diplomatic um, representation in Israel to the level of a consulate. Um, in 1980, um, Israel agrees East Jerusalem and declares Jerusalem a capital. Turkey is again reduces the le level of diplomatic representation. In 1980, Turkish diplomats reassert upgrade to ambassadorial level. So it goes all the way through about all the different history. I could send this to you. Um, but it's kind of an up and down relationship constantly. Um, so in the recent stuff that's more pertinent to us, I guess, um, there's a second intifada in 2000 with uh, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon visiting Jerusalem. Um, uh, Turkey-Israel ties again come under a huge strain. 2006, Israel attacks Lebanon during major protests in Turkey. Israel attack, in 2008, Israel attacks the uh, blockade Gaza Strip, killing more than 14,000 Palestinians. Turkey condemns the offense. So it just kind of keeps going downhill from, from here. Um, in 2009, and Rogan um, publicly shuns Israel Therese in the World Economic Forum and David Switzerland. In 2010, Turkey suspends diplomatic relationships with Israel after Mavi Mawara incident. 2016, Israel accepts Turkish request to normalize relations, including compensating family for the victims. Um, and in 2013, Benjamin Netanyahu voices regret over a disagreement. So things are moving along a little healthier pace towards getting a trade agreement, and now it's going to fall all apart because of what's happening. So this is a very valuable map. It's the volume of Israeli trade with selected Arab and Muslim countries in 2017. I couldn't get a newer one than this. Sorry. Um, I love the, the verse at the bottom from De De Deuteronomy. It says, when the Lord your God blesses you and he has promised you, you will lend to many nations but not borrow. You will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. So these are Israeli exports on the right-hand side. The top one is Turkey, um, and this is in the millions of dollars. And then Azerbaijan is number two, then Nigeria, Egypt, um, Indonesia, Jordan, Kazakhstan, Morocco, Uzbekistan, Senegal, Cordo, uh, I can't remember how to say that one, in the lime green, Malaysia, uh, Cameroon, Turkmenistan, and Gabon. So, and these are where they import from, and there's a good amount from Turkey as well. So, um, you can see they would have had a very good relationship as far as trade is concerned, but this latest incident is going to cause a big problem, and it will probably disalign Turkey from the rest of it. I think this one's really helpful. It's hard for us as Americans to really understand who has good relations, who has bad relationships between countries. So all the countries are listed on the top row and they're listed on the side, and the diagonal hash marks are where the same country is talking about itself, so you can read them out. The ones I kind of wanted you to pay attention to is Israel's um, in relationship with their other um, friends. So out of all of them, there's only two, which is the United States and Egypt, that Israel has uh, a good relationship with. If you look at the circle in the third column, two up from the bottom, where Turkey and Hamas, that's the only country they really get along with, <laughs> which I thought was rather rather interesting. Um, and you can tell a lot about whether these are green happy faces, which means they have good relations, yellow, which means it's kind of tense, uh, red where they are absolute enemies, um, and it's not a lot of green on the board, pretty much. It's a, it's a very volatile area between all these different countries. Does anybody have any questions about this or comments? If there's something you notice, let me know. Okay. Um, I did that one. I have to go. Okay, here we go. So this week, it was big news that Biden came on and he said what? He took, we killed the top guy. Even though he blew himself up, we killed the top guy. Um, so he blew himself up. It was in Syria. And 
Um, it was a U.S. raid, and they figured it out, and they blew themselves up before America get, get to them, but they still declared it a huge victory. So can anybody read this, or shall I read it? Because I don't want to make anybody. Go ahead, Jeff. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> a daring raid by U.S. Special Operations Forces that resulted in the death of the ISIS leader offered a vivid reminder that the chaos in Syria continues to reverberate. <coughs> a daring pre-dawn raid. <coughs> it's fine until I started to read. A daring pre-dawn raid by U.S. Special Operations Forces in Syria that resulted in the death of the Islamic State's leader offered a vivid reminder that no one no matter how much the world might want to move on, the chaos in Syria continues to reverberate. The sudden roar of an American Apache attack helicopters in a pastoral patch of northwestern Syria gave way on Thursday to a firefight inside a three-story building surrounded by olive trees. The raid resulted in the death of this target, Abu Ibrahim al-Hashimi al-Qurashi, the largely unknown leader of the Islamic State or ISIS since 2019. U.S. officials said he blew himself up and killed 12 others as the commandos closed in. So America claims this is a win. Biden sort of needed this just like Obama needed what? He killed Osama bin Laden. There's a lot of similarities between these two as well, which is rather interesting. And he was ruling um, for, for the last three years as the head of the organization. We haven't heard a lot from ISIS, have we? Oh, yes, go ahead. So these... Um, Chopping the heads off of a hydra is, is just not the way, he doesn't accomplish anything. He's, he's just in charge today. As soon as he's gone, the next in command's in charge. Yep. That's the way they're structured. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that, that we make a big deal out of it, but. But, but the president counts on because America doesn't know what's going on. It seems like a big win. It's like huge. And it's, it's really not because, like you said, this snake regrows its head over and over and over again. It used to be like you cut off the head of the snake and it was gone. Um, yes? You know that uh, really established their position in Syria where mm -hmm. they're kind of, you know, dabbling in it right now. But what, what's Russia's response to the U.S. carrying all these, you know, attacks in a sense behind their back? They have a very, as far as I can tell, a very tentative agreement. You stay in your camp and I'll stay in mine and we won't interfere with each other. We won't shoot each other's planes down. It's kind of like a little piece of word, yes, we're both here, but uh, Russia really wants Syria because it's a warm water port. And that is what they've been looking for forever. So they're not just stuck in the Black Sea. Now they have everything in Syria and the Mediterranean, which means they can go through the Suez Canal and be in the Indian Ocean in a, in a set. So that's all good. Um, but it is tenuous. I'm always waiting for something bad to happen, like uh, Aragon or and, and Rogan, however you pronounce it. He shot down one of the Russian planes three or four years ago while they were doing operations, and it was very tense as what was going to happen to Russia and Turkey during that incident. Yes, Jeffrey? It was Hamas that shot him down. Oh, really? Yeah, it wasn't the Syrian nationals. It was Hamas shot him down. That's what I recall. Yeah, but who are the Hamas funded by? Right, yeah, they're there. They're letting them be there. <laughs> so <coughs> it's hard to know what all the players are. Can I have a reader for this one, or can we keep going? Thank you, Casey. We can move forward a little bit if it's too far. Years of military action by the United States and its international partners aimed at stamping out terrorism have exacted major tolls, first against al-Qaeda, and then against the Islamic State, which rose from the turmoil of the Iraq War and the collapse of the Syrian state. But even as an untold number of fighters have been killed and leaders eliminated, both groups have adapted into more diffuse organizations, adept at finding new havens from which to launch opportunistic violence. The Taliban's takeover of, Af of Afghanistan this summer, facilitated by the US military's withdrawal, refocused international attention on the prospect of terrorists regaining the country as a haven. In Iraq, the Islamic State recently killed 10 soldiers and an officer at an army post and beheaded a police officer on camera. In Syria, 
It has assassinated scores of local leaders extorting businesses to finance its operations. In Afghanistan, the withdrawal of American forces in August left the local Islamic State affiliate to battle the Taliban, with often disastrous consequences for civilians caught in the middle. The recent attacks by ISIS, said Mick Mulroy, a former top Pentagon official and retired CIA paramilitary operations officer, indicate that ISIS is not done fighting, nor is the US and our partners. So it's shifting turf, and every time there's a power vacuum, what happens? When there was a power vacuum in Afghanistan, what happened? They do. And when there was a power vacuum in Syria, what happened? It's like an abscess tooth. It gets infected and it terrorizes the whole region around it and everybody hurts. So I think that's a pretty good analogy for what's going on and why these organizations are all linking up against Israel. Um, and they're being funded underhanded. So does everybody know what proxy war is being fought between Iran and Saudi Arabia right now? Yemen. And it's been horrible. Did we hear about it in the United States? Hardly anything. Um, it is disastrous, and it's been like a genocide of their own people. So Saudi Arabia sends them weapons and sends them planes and sends them money, and so does Iran. And so they're fighting each other through Yemen civil war, and everybody is getting destroyed. So it doesn't make uh, much American sense to even publish anything about it because we don't want to get involved, and there's nothing we can do. Um, we're not about to step on Saudi toes that we don't want to uh, directly confront Iran. So it's kind of just left to uh, simmer on its own. Um, anyway, so the raid, this is more about the raid, but for sake of time, I think there was one more area I wanted to get to. Yep. Bastard, just do it this way. Okay. Um, give me one second. We're almost done with the end of it. So what we're going to talk about now is Russia and China, and then we'll be finished. I'm sorry? I know, I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling down to get to the right place because there's so many slides. Okay. So <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, I told you there was a, a partnership developing between China and Russia. China wants Taiwan. They want the North China Sea. They want to make sure it's internationally recognized. The whole Pan-Pacific area has been firmly against this, including Australia, New Zealand, um, India, Vietnam, um, Laos. All these different countries in Southeast Asia are pitting themselves against China because what are they doing? They're making little islands in the South China Sea. They take a bunch of dirt, they dump it in the ground, and the ocean, and they make a small island. They say, we demand our international Chinese water go another 12 nautical miles from this point. So slowly, like a chess match across the North China Sea, they're creating these little islands that mean nothing so they can claim more international territory. So I want you to understand that first of all because it affects international trade with Korea, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, and everybody else. Um, so what's going on now is, little deal in the back room where Putin says to China, you help us with Ukraine and our problems, we'll help you get Taiwan. It's really like playing the game of risk. It's like, who do you make alliances with so you can stay alive a little bit longer? And I want this and you want that. You help me get this and I'll help you get that. I said about two weeks ago this was going to happen, and it just did, which is um, the General Secretary of Chinese Communist Party and Paramount Leader of China, um, Moscow, American and European officials 
uh, may be staying away from the Beijing Winter Olympics because of the human rights concerns, but Russia, President Vladimir Putin, will be on hand even if the tensions soar over the building, uh, buildup of troops along the country's border with Ukraine. Putin's talk with Chinese President, um, help me with, say his name correctly, uh, is it Xi Jinping, is that right? Jinping? I just want to make sure there's sometimes there's different phonetic spellings in different countries. Huh? <laughs> okay, Jinping. Uh, oh no, I lost my place. Uh, fourth quote. Okay, yeah. Is playing the important stabilizing role in global affairs and helping make international affairs more equitable and inclusive. Not happening. Um, the Russian president criticized attempts by some countries to politicize sports in the benefit of their ambitions, an apparent reference to the diplomatic boycott of the Olympics by the US and some of its allies. So he's like, I can't believe you're making uh, sports an issue. It shouldn't be politicized. Yes, Brandon. Two things. The television camera showed Putin at the opening ceremonies. And I read a while back that whenever there's a deal between China and Russia, whether even selling gas and oil, China's in the driver's seat. Russia's just a secondary player. Yeah, they are. Because other than Putin, there aren't a whole lot of wealthy other than the gangsters in Moscow. So, um, did we read this slide? Go ahead, Jesse. Okay. Vladimir Isenchukov. He's, he's, the, he's the reporter. You don't have to read that below. Okay. Sorry. EU spokesman Nabila Masrali reacted to that by stating that we uh, are, of course, fully committed to contribute to promoting and protecting sports integrity and to strengthen universal respect for human rights. Big sports events such as the Olympic Games often have a universal audience, Masrali said. They can be instrumental for spreading positive values and promoting freedom and human rights at the global level. However, however such platforms should not be used for political propaganda. So he's siding with the Russians. And what he's told us before that is Captain Obvious. I keep reading, sorry. Many Western officials are skipping the Beijing games in protest of China's detention of more than one million Uyghur Muslims in the northwest region of Xinjiang. But leaders of the ex-Soviet Central Asian nations, which have close ties with both Russia and China, are followed, all followed Putin's lead in attending. In an interview with China Media Group, in an interview with China Media Group, also released Thursday, Putin emphasized that we oppose the attempts to politicize sport or use it as a tool of coercion, unfair competition, and discrimination. And who was the country that was the most charged for using different drugs to help Russia. their athletes? Russia. So, so the reason that China is in the driver's seat, the reason that China is powerful is because the U.S. buys everything from China, and all of the U.S. wealth is transferred to China, and that's we don't buy a lot of stuff from from Russia. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting that we have created this monster because they're willing to sacrifice their people's labor for pennies an hour or day or whatever it is, and we're willing to gobble up everything they make really cheap. Mm -hmm. So we we moved a lot of our manufacturing over there. What was the big compromise was kind of like, come, oh, we'll do your manufacturing for cheap. Meanwhile, they were getting all the information they did, needed it to do themselves. Does the Chinese Republic um, obey the patent laws of the United States? Question. So whatever we manufacture, whatever is manufactured in any other country, they don't care if it's copyrighted or patented. They're going to make it, and they're going to make it a quarter or a tenth the cost that we do. So we have sold everything, all of our technology. And what I want you to realize is it's not just a matter of stealing technology. There are billions and billions of R, D, T, and E money that has to go in before you ever make a product. So the research, the development, the testing, and the evaluation all gets lost. China gets, China gets the final product, and they get to start making it right away. Randy. Part of the deal, and Americans are so greedy, Part of the deal is that 
they have to give their secrets to the Chinese in order to do business in China. And American companies are so greedy, they're willing, some of them are willing to do that. Yeah, so it's, it's a huge compromise. And this, what, what this is leading to is what the um, United States, the only real threat that the United States put on Putin if he went forward in Ukraine was what? Sanctions. So how is he going to get out from under U.S. sanctions? Deal with China. And this is a big warning to all of us. If they do this, they might have enough power to get the dollar off the international standard. If they accomplish that, we will go through an economic recession that makes 1929 look like nothing. It looked like a picnic compared to what we're going to go through. How far in debt are we? $30 trillion and growing every day. And China owns a lot of that debt. So I'm just telling you, the, the showdown at high noon is coming. And if these two align and get the dollar off the international standard, we're in deep trouble. Yes, Casey. Um, actually, uh, the debt um, of that 30 trillion, seven and a half trillion is held by other countries and one trillion of that is held by China. So mm. one trillion out of 30 trillion. Mm. It's still a lot. That's amazing. Yeah. A lot of countries own it. So it's a, it's a big danger. Um, I just wanted you to understand this. Um, Putin's meeting uh, with the in attendance um, at the opening ceremony announced the further promotion of Chinese-Russian relationships, said um, Li Xing, the director of the Institute for European and Asian Studies in Shanghai's University of Political Science and Law, China and Russia will increasingly found common cause over what they believe the U.S. disregarded for the territory and sovereign concerns, Li said. Both of their countries have also taken to mocking the U.S. over its domestic travails from last year's Capitol riot and its struggle to control COVID-19. The U.S. and Western countries, on the other hand, are exerting pressure against Russia over the issue of Ukraine, and on the other hand, are exerting pressure against China over the use of Taiwan, Ling said, referring to the self-governing island democracy and its U.S. allies that China claims to be their own territory. Such acts of extreme pressure by the West will only fuse China and Russia to further strengthening cooperation. Uh, Yuri Shishao, uh, I can't even say it right, Ushikao, uh, Putin's foreign uh, advisor, affairs advisor, um, said that Putin's visit would mark a new stage of the Russian-Chinese partnership that was described as a key factor contributing to the sustaining global development and helping counter destructive activities by certain countries. So we talk about the alliance of Germany and Japan in World War II and the Allies. How much stronger is Russia with China than World War II allies put together? Um, it's a much more serious threat um, and very dangerous for us. And they're making fun of the US. And the US is one country trying to make this happen with a bunch of smaller partners who can't agree on what to do. Not anybody in the EU can agree on how to respond to Ukraine, and they're not really that willing to help Taiwan either. So <clears throat> here's what's going on in Ukraine right now. Um, this is more about what's going on, but I wanted to show you, this is the country of Taiwan. It's just off the coast of China. Um, and so this Taiwan Straits that you see here to the left of the island is part of the whole conglomeration of the North China Sea that China is trying to control. So if they can't take over these countries, they're going to take over the, the waters so they can't do international trade. There's a lot here, but I want to stop on time. Um, I'll just read this one. So Russian President Vladimir Putin and China uh, and Russia would resist Western sanctions pressures on every opportunity on the eve of the revival of Beijing for the Winter Olympics. Um, in remarks given in the Chinese state media ahead of the arrival, Putin also said that the two nations were to concur or are really close on most international issues and their ties are um, not influenced by ideology. We are considering expanding settlements into national territories and creating a mechanisms to offset the negative impact of unilateral sanctions, he said in an article carrying his 
which is byline, um, which was published by the state news, news agency Thing Who on Thursday. Putin did not name any third country, but Moscow and Beijing have been standing together on a range of issues from the diplomatic boycott of the games by the US and some of its allies to Russian tensions with Washington over and NATO over Ukraine. In this article, Putin highlighted last year's 20th anniversary with China-Russian Friendly Relations Treaty, saying that the cooperation is on an equal basis and free from political and ideological circumstances. So I like this little editorial cartoon down here. You got the American Eagle flying away and the Russian bear and the Chinese panda together. So um, any, um, this is another picture of the area. I think that's the end of it, yep. So any other questions or thoughts that anybody wants to share? We're just living in a very exciting times and there's certainly a lot happening on the world stage that is rearranging political maps. So there's a lot of empire building and things for us might change very drastically in the next year. Yes, Randy. This is going way back to Afghanistan, but they say uh, many millions of Afghans may starve to death this winter because the Taliban, is that who it is, Taliban? Yep. Are not giving them food and they're not, they haven't got any way to heat their homes. There's no, no economy to speak of and they're just in a very bad state. They are, it's, a, it's an extreme situation. So it's in the millions of how many will die. And the US, when it left, it left more helicopters in Afghanistan, this is one statistic I read, than all the helicopters they have in Australia. So I was like, oh my goodness. It's just the amount of weapons we left behind for the Taliban to just scoop up. I am just like baffled by it all. But anyway, um, 